Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight. We now turn to our Crime Time segment where we take a look at crime stories from around the nation and get some insight and perspective from law enforcement professionals who we bring in here each and every night. Let's introduce tonight's special guest. Joining us, retired Los Angeles Police Department Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant Dorsey started with the LAPD in 1980. She worked in patrol and specialized units, including gangs. And she's the author of Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate. Also with us, Assistant Chief Jailer and former Chief of the Major Crime Section, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III. Adam served as a police officer for 30 years. He oversaw homicide cases, robberies, special victims units, and a gun assault team. And he is the former assistant police academy director. Lieutenant Colonel Sergeant Cheryl, great to have you both back with us. Thanks. First story tonight, some video released by the Phoenix Police Department. A man with a gun shot by police. I'm breaking in the 27 Avenue in Bethany Home and the beer and wine liquor store. And it's one guy uh, with a gun outside. I don't know what, what intention, but he got uh, in the gun and, and go inside the store. He has a gun and he went inside the beer and liquor store? Yes, and, and, and he got uh, the gun. An officer responded to the location and contacted the 911 caller. They learned that Omar was walking around while displaying the handgun and making statements about scaring people. They began searching the area and quickly located him walking on a nearby residential street. Officers attempted to speak with Omar, but he immediately ran from them. The two officers got out of their vehicle and ran after him. As Omar was running away, one of the officers saw him remove a handgun from his shorts and approach the front door of a residence. Hey, Once at the door, stop? Omar no, fired no, his handgun hey, as he was hey, trying to enter the home. Hey. Not knowing if this residence was occupied with potential victims, one officer fired his duty weapon in an effort to stop Omar. Omar was struck by the gunfire. First shot you hear was fired by Omar, and the last three by the officer. Hey, can you stop? Talk to us. Hey, hands out your pocket. Hands out your pocket. Hey. Hands out your pocket. hey. Omar was able to get into the house, so the officers tried to Come make outside, contact with the Come residents outside, to make sure they were safe. Come outside, ma'am. Come outside. Come outside. Over here. Officers moved residents out of the house. They saw Omar sitting on the floor. He told officers he had accidentally fired the Why handgun. Why were you shooting? I wasn't shooting. No, right now when I tried to open the door, it, it went off. Yeah, exactly. That's why. It went Senor! After the last Come occupant exited, Come on. officers had Omar crawl outside where he was detained. Let me see your hands. Where's the gun? Do not reach for your pocket. You will be shot. I know. I don't got no guns, man. I don't keep, got no guns. Keep scooting now. Omar was arrested for one count of aggravated assault on a police officer and one count of disorderly conduct for recklessly handling the firearm. All right, was this a justified use of force? Sergeant Cheryl, he said he accidentally fired the gun when police approached. Well, that may very well have been an accident since we understand that he was entering his own residence and he knew that there were family members inside, but we saw him... Uh, mishandling that weapon in the convenience store, taking the magazine uh, in and out and flashing it so that others could see him chambering around. And so I don't know if he thought this was fun uh, or funny, but, you know, when you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Lieutenant Colonel, uh, I'm looking at this guy again, uh, you know, in the liquor store with the gun. Some people are a little afraid what he's saying. And then when police approach him, his his gun goes off. Absolutely. Uh, uh, this is sort of reminiscent of two uh, landmark Supreme Court cases uh, put together. There's a little bit of both of them uh, in, in this situation. There's Tennessee uh, v. Garner and Graham versus Connor. Every police officer is quite familiar with those two uh, Supreme Court cases. Uh, and so uh, they could argue, not knowing that he was entering his own residence, they could argue that they feared for the safety of the residents that were inside. Whether or not he shot the weapon at them or not, he could have shot that weapon uh, at the door, and those officers still would have been justified 
uh, under those two uh, landmark Supreme Court decisions. Sergeant, how about uh, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee dropping the Supreme Court on us here? That's pretty good. Um, let, you know, I'm looking at this, this situation. You've got all those people inside, and it takes some time to get the other residents out of the house. Explain for us what's going on in the minds of the officers at the scene as you're trying to get the people without the gun out of the house. Well, they don't know the relationship between the person that just entered and the folks that they're trying to get out. And so they want to be very careful, number one, to not put them in harm's way in terms of this guy who had a gun at some point, don't know exactly where it is right now. And certainly they don't want to uh, have an accidental discharge and then hurt one of these people as they're calling them out. So you can see it's very chaotic. Officers show great restraint and um, common sense, good judgment, all of that. And it, it resolved itself peacefully, thankfully, and no one other than this suspect uh, sustained an injury. Yeah, he was hurt, but not killed, which, again, is good news as well. All right, let's get to our next story from w WPIX in New York. A woman killed in a hit and run. hit by a car. Who knows if she's alive? Just before sunup Sunday, this Manhattan street was turned into a crime scene. They're putting crime scene table. They were doing resuscitation. Police say 29-year-old Christina Villacres, who was walking across 7th Avenue near 24th Street, was hit by a driver in a minivan and left on the road for dead. The fact that somebody could do something that terrible and just not even stop or worry about that person is horrifying. It happened yards away from where Kenzie Donor lives. We actually walked by this morning going to the grocery store and saw the police out here marking things off and we saw literally shoes in the road. We're told the woman died at the hospital minutes after she arrived. It's terrifying, but honestly not surprising. That's because many drivers treat this avenue in Chelsea like a highway, according to people in the area who say at times they're forced to dodge cars while crossing. We're trying to catch the light at the light changing, and meanwhile they're going like 60, 70 miles an hour. It's sad, but I knew that was going to happen. It was just a matter of time. Now, as people like Kenzie look twice before crossing the street, police are on the hunt for the driver who took off and never looked back. They need more police, traffic police. You know, 8 million potential witnesses, right, in New York City, a busy city, uh, but maybe so busy that no one really pays attention. How do you track down this driver? Where are you going to look? How are you going to investigate this? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, where do you start? I would start with cameras. I, I can imagine in, in New York there should be hundreds of cameras in that intersection somewhere. And uh, I would be taking a look at all the cameras, see if I can identify that vehicle. Uh, there, may, there may be some trace evidence left over from the paint or, or, or anything like that uh, that may be on the body of the uh, young lady that was killed. So I would be trying to see if I could identify the paint color. Um, there might be a, a connection there that they could uh, follow up on the lead with the paint and, uh, and witnesses. And that's about as far as you can go. Uh, you're going to be looking for a car that's going to probably have some damage to it because I'm sure when it came into contact with the young lady, there was some amount of damage. Sergeant Dorsey, you, you worked in Los Angeles, another huge city, so many people. Um, did you find in your time that a city could be so big that no one really pays attention as much as they would to something like this happening in a smaller town? Well, I, I don't think the size of the town has anything to do with it. I mean, it's not often you see someone hit by a car, and so it wouldn't be... Uh, unexpected that someone would see that but not really have an opportunity for their mind to kick in and really understand what it was that just happened. And so a lot of what is going to happen in terms of identifying this driver will be in the follow-up investigation done by the detectives. Once they identify the vehicle, find the registered owner, have a conversation with that person to verify whether or not they were the ones driving the car or if they loaned it to someone else. And I know this to be a possibility because I worked traffic division for five years that sometimes folks will get home, understand the severity of what they've been involved in, and then try to report their vehicle stolen so as to say, it wasn't me, my car was stolen and it was someone else. So this is going to be a very involved investigation for a little bit. All right, when we return, more crime time, including a story involving a suspected child predator arrested 
but not just any old suspected child predator, someone who's trying to get a job as a school teacher. We'll talk about that when we return. Aaron Hernandez at the time reached out to a fake uh, social media account that the detective uses um, where he's posing as a 14 year old uh, girl. Kind of like that to catch a predator situation there. Another one of the stories we're looking at tonight in our Crime Time segment where we bring in law enforcement professionals still with us tonight. Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey and Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III. Our next story tonight comes to us from KJRH in Tulsa, Oklahoma. A suspected child predator arrested. Tulsa County Sheriff's investigators say they made the arrest in the nick of time. He's a first year hire um, at Tulsa Public Schools, so um, we're happy to know that he didn't you know, get around any, any students um, to be able to, to prey on them. Aaron Hernandez got his teaching license just last month. Investigators say on July 22nd, he began preying on someone he thought was a 14-year-old girl. Aaron Hernandez at the time reached out to a fake uh, social media account that the detective uses um, where he's posing as a 14-year-old uh, uh, girl. Detectives say the conversation started on the app Whisper, then moved to Snapchat. They began a dialogue over, over the phone um, where it didn't take long for lewd proposals and, uh, to be sent uh, from Mr. Hernandez. Uh, to include and eventually uh, elicit photographs. Investigators say Hernandez made several attempts to schedule a meeting. Then Monday morning, they say he agreed to meet at an abandoned building in West Tulsa. Tulsa County Sheriff's deputies were there waiting. We actually uh, made it a traffic stop on him at 5800 South 33rd West, where we took him into custody. Tulsa County investigators say Hernandez has no criminal history in Tulsa County. They're looking into whether Hernandez has made any contact with actual minors. All right, so how careful do school systems have to be? Um, Sergeant uh, Dorsey, you know, from my experience in covering cases like this, a lot of these predators look for ways to contact potential victims. So they sign up to be coaches, they volunteer in youth organizations, and, and some, unfortunately, try to become school teachers. So how careful do you think schools need to be? Well, I think they are generally very careful. And we know that there was a background investigation done on this uh, potential applicant. Now, he was able to pass this background. So um, how he was able to slip through the crack, if you will, is going to determine what they need to do to change that system. Uh, what, what was it that they uh, didn't ask? Uh, what did they miss? What should they have asked? You can only do what you can do. And thank God he revealed himself on another platform that allowed them to cut him off at the knees, if you will, before he had an opportunity to get uh, in front of fresh victims. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III, you know, the Internet can be a, a, you know, a haven for these predators, but it also can be used as a great tool to find these predators before they strike again. Well, sure. Mo most police agencies have a, a cyber crimes unit, uh, at least most large police agencies do, that uh, basically that's their job. They hunt for these types of predators, uh, people that are scamming people uh, through the use of the internet, social media, and uh, usually they do a pretty, a pretty good job. They, they set up fake accounts pretending to be someone they're not, and that, that helps them to, to catch these guys. I always like the, the proactive policing in, in these types of cases because you don't want more child victims, right? The prosecutor can get those cases and, and, and try to you know, prosecute them, but we just want to have less victims out there. That's the ultimate goal. Final story tonight. This is the feel-good story from KMTV in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, police officer trading cards.
In La Vista, Police Chief Bob Lawson and his officers are bringing back the 90s. That is with a community outreach initiative they had in the mid-90s and early 2000s. Each officer has their own individual card with their picture and their badge, and then the back has a little biographical information about them. And we've been using those as a community engagement tool to uh, meet up and uh, break the ice with a lot of the youth that's here in the city of La Vista. Officer Nick Boswell carries his own card. Nick's married with four boys and his hobbies include fishing, working out, coaching base and coaching baseball. The Next goal is my guys. Interact more with the people they serve. What's new? In efforts to move forward with community relations. I think it's an opportunity for us when we're engaging with the kids in the community to kind of humanize the badge. You know, we get so much negativity sometimes it's out there and they get to know that, hey, we're just the guy that's grilling in our driveway down the street or coaching baseball or, you know, uh, the guy that's living next door to you. And so being able to learn a little bit about us is pretty neat. And then they get to know us on a a first name basis, which is awesome. You know who that guy is? Him! That's me especially given the tension between protesters and police departments throughout the country in recent weeks. You guys want to kick the ball around? Yeah! I'll let you so far, it's Good obvious. The initiative is paying off. We've seen a lot of kids fl- uh, flagging us down now as we're driving through the neighborhoods, which has been really cool. Some shifts are now offering an incentive for kids to collect all of the department's cards. We've got one little boy that's just not far from the police department here that he's got a good number of them. And that's he, he talked with us a couple weeks ago, and it's one of his goals. So he's been trying to, to reach out to each one of the, the officers on the department. And in return, one kid even created his own card to give back. So I have another one like that on my locker in my in the patrol patrol room, which comes to show even the smallest right, interaction. Be good today. We'll see you. Yeah, you bet. Can make a difference. Who knows? Could be worth more than my Ken Griffey Jr. trading card. Well, what else can police do to to reach our youth, uh, Lieutenant Colonel? Uh, what do you think? I mean, this this seems to work in this community. What are some other ways? Oh. I- before I say that, Vinny, I just want to say, and I'm sure Cheryl will agree with me, this is not going to work in every community. Absolutely. Um, it's a good story for that community. But more importantly, uh, the types of communities that we've been seeing um, throughout this uh, situation um, involving Mr. Floyd, I think we need more officers that are from the communities that they serve. I think those communities uh, that are, have been underserved uh, would, would gain by seeing individuals that are from their community. Uh, uh, Years ago, they started recruiting officers from all over the United States to to go to different communities or work in different communities communities that they did not grow up in, they're not familiar with. And so I think there was a disconnect there uh, that could be connected if we started to hire more police officers from closer to home, if that makes sense. Oh, it, it does make sense. Uh, Sergeant, your thoughts about how else police can uh, reach out to, to youth? Well, listen, I, I, let me just say this real quick, because I was on the LAPD in the, in the 80s and the 90s when we did that very thing. And I worked all parts of the city of Los Angeles, and it works. It's a good rapport builder, you know, and when you start with the little ones, they really do take a sense of pride in, you know, how many cards they're collecting. They get to know you, you get to know them. And so it's just about interaction. And while maybe every department won't be able to create a situation where they can pass out cards, I think if an officer just took a moment out of their day, and we have plenty of downtime to just relate, just have a conversation. It's all about who you know. You know me, I know you, you like me, I like you. And then when something goes bad, they feel a sense of comfort and and relief because, hey, it's Officer Dorsey, it's Sergeant Dorsey, and we already know one another. So I think this is amazing. And I hope that more departments will have this kind of interaction between police and community. Yeah, I got to get my uh, Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey rookie card. I need that. But by the way, uh, good news, folks. We now have the official Crime Time trading cards. First up, let's take a look at the Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey Crime Time trading card. Let's put that up on the screen for folks to see. There it is. Beautiful. Look at that. Very valuable. And and, That's what's up. And I know know Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee... uh, May not be the biggest fan, but uh, his card has some value as well. Let's take a look at that one. There you go. 
I like it. Can I get a copy of both of those? <laughs> we, we will uh, have them printed out by our department, and uh, we'll have them sent out to you both. And, but now there's going to be a big demand. I'm going to get all these uh, uh, messages on Facebook for these trading and, cards. And I need but, a Vinny uh, card. Great job. I need a, I need a Vinny card. I need a Vinny card. Vinny card. <laughs> Vinny card. Good stuff. Well, Sergeant Dorsey, Lieutenant Colonel Adam Lee III, thank you both so much. Really appreciate your input, your honesty, and your passion. Thanks a lot.